Well, good evening, everyone. I'm delighted that you're able to join us to worship God together as the United Church in Rill. We're going to uh, we're going to sing our praise this evening, and I'd really encourage you to sing out the hymns, even if you're by yourself in your front room, because God delights to hear you praise Him. We're going to hear from God's Word, and we're going to reflect on what God is saying to us by His Holy Spirit. And later in the service, there is an opportunity for us to share in communion together. If you want to do this, then you like, might like to make sure that you have a little bread and a cup with some wine or juice or, or water in whatever you've got to hand and whatever you're comfortable to use. Have that to hand. And if you need to pause now to go and sort that out, then do and come and join us in a moment. We worship together as, uh, as a family, as God's people, all connected through our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. As a family, we share in each other's joys and journey with each other through difficult and sad times. We were saddened to hear this week of the death of Dave Jones early on Friday morning. Dave was a true gentleman, a delight and a joy to know. A fellow cornet player, uh, we shared passions of brass band music and, uh, and football as well. He's now at peace from the dementia that he journeyed with, through with grace and strength. He is a testimony that nothing in all creation can ever separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Perhaps you would join me in prayer, giving thanks for Dave and lifting up his wife Margaret and their family to God. Let's, uh, let's pray. Lord God, we come to worship and praise you this evening. And as we bring you our thanks and praise, we want to thank you for Dave. We want to thank you for the joy and delight it was to know a true gentleman who cared and loved and lived with such integrity and thoughtfulness. Lord God, I want to thank you for showing your love to Dave and drawing him to your side. We pray that that same love might surround Margaret and their family at the moment. We bring you these prayers in Jesus' most wonderful and precious name. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, friends, restrictions for funeral services remain in place just at the moment. We will, of course, let our church family know when the funeral service is to take place. And I know you will want to stand with Margaret and the family at that time. Psalm 19 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the works of his hands. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. And then this last verse I've just changed so it reflects all of us. May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, my rock and our Redeemer. And so let's, uh, let's sing our praise in our opening hymn this evening, All Creatures of Our God and King. All creatures of our God and King Lift up your heart and with us sing Rushing wind that art 
so strong Ye clouds that sail in heaven along Oh, praise Him, Alleluia The rising morn in praise rejoice Ye lights of evening find a voice Oh, praise Him him. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. And all that the of tender heart, forgiving others, take your part. Sing ye, Alleluia! Ye who long pain and sorrow bear, praise God and on Him cast your care. Oh, praise Him! Oh, praise Him! Wonderful hymn of praise. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's, uh, let's pray. Lord God, we join together with the whole of creation to worship you and to praise your holy name this evening. We want to thank you for the blessings that we know that have come from you and the depths of your character. We thank you that you have not forsaken us or turned from us but instead you continue to show us mercy and love, grace and peace, joy and strength. Oh Lord God, we praise you for your great faithfulness. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. His faithfulness to show us grace and love against all else from upon the cross offering forgiveness and salvation to us. Oh Lord God, we praise you and we thank you. Pour out your Holy Spirit now as we look at your word. Speak to us, correct us, encourage us, draw us to your side that as disciples of Christ, we may indeed follow him and bring him glory and praise. We ask this in his powerful and majestic name. Amen. Well, in recent weeks, we've been considering different aspects of our discipleship. And tonight we consider uh, the relationship between discipleship and prayer. Uh, and we're going to hear our Bible reading now for this evening from, uh, from the Gospel of Matthew. Hi, my name's Andrew. Some of you might know me as Barbara and Tony Barclay's son. I'm currently living near Tembe, working as a zookeeper down here. So today's Bible reading comes from Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 to 15. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts, as we have also forgiven our debtors, 
and lead us not into, into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive the other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sin, your Father will not forgive your sins. was lost in darkest night, yet thought I knew the way, the sin that promised joy and life had led me to the grave. I had no hope that you would own a rebel to Let's pray. 
Lord God, as we turn to your word now, we pray that you would speak to us. That you would make us more like Christ. As we hear your word, as we look to apply that word, and as your Holy Spirit moves amongst us now. Speak to us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, some years ago now, I spent some time studying the book of Galatians and getting to grips with some of the debates that theologians and scholars from around the world have had in recent years over interpreting the words of Paul's letter. As I studied, I came to appreciate the work of, uh, of several scholars, uh, one in particular, Don Carson, who wrote with such passion and clarity about God's word and what Paul was trying to say. And his work helped to shape the dissertation that I was writing and my own understanding and thought to. Don Carson is a Canadian uh, living in America. He's the Emeritus Professor of New Testament at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, uh, just north of Chicago. He's a passionate preacher and has written widely on the New Testament. A few years after I completed my studies and my dissertation, I was planning on going to the Keswick Bible Convention and discovered that the main Bible study sessions were to be led by Don Carson. It was an awesome privilege to hear God speak through Don Carson that year. On the Sunday of that week, Don preached in one of the local churches and I walked for what seemed like miles to go and hear him preach. He preached on a passage just a couple of chapters on from the one that we've heard tonight, Matthew uh, chapter 11. I can still remember uh, his message that night. And on the way out of the chapel, I had the awesome privilege to shake Don's hand and to thank him for his teaching and his preaching. I explained I'd studied his work on Galatians and his reply to me was, poor fellow. I left then before I made uh, made a fool of myself. But I was filled also with a huge sense of what, a, what an immense privilege it was to actually meet this man and to thank him and learn from him and to hear him preach. An awesome privilege. I wonder if you've had a, had a similar experience, that, that sense of an awesome privilege of meeting someone that you admire a celebrity maybe, or a member of the royal family, someone that you've seen on your TV screen or read about in your newspaper or whose books you've read. And when you come away, you're filled with that sense of oh, privilege. Wow, I've just met. And then, of course, a story to tell of what the conversation was like or, or what you did or you didn't do together. For the disciple of Jesus, for for a Christian, prayer is an awesome privilege. It shouldn't be possible for sinful, broken human beings like you and me to approach and speak and to meet with our incredibly holy and righteous God, the creator and sustainer of the whole of creation. Yet Jesus says to his disciples in tonight's passage, Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Well, these very familiar words that we know as the Lord's Prayer, they speak, don't they, of the awesome privilege that it is to pray. Just to approach God and call him our Father tells us of the kind of intimate, personal relationship that Jesus wants us to have with our God. It was so Christ's deepest desire 
that he would go to the cross, suffering in our place, that we would be welcomed into God's family and be able to call him our father, personally, intimately, our father. But Jesus also says that he's not just our father, but he is our father in heaven. Whilst we are drawn into a personal, wonderful, intimate relationship with God, he still remains that holy, true, powerful, majestic creator and sustainer of the whole of creation. Christ has not only brought God to earth, but has also raised us with him into the heights to meet with the holy, omnipotent God of heaven and earth who hears and is able to respond to even more than all we can ask or imagine as the Apostle Paul would put it. Now just a, a couple of things to note here before we, before we move on and look at the next part of the Lord's Prayer. First this, this personal relationship with God through Christ is the foundation for fruitful and life-giving prayer lives. The encouragement in our discipleship. There are, of course, understandably, some who struggle with this idea that God is a loving father, especially when an earthly father has not shown love or has failed in their role as a parent. Friends, friends, if this is you and how you feel, what you may have been through has brought sorrow to the heart of God too. He, though, is your Father in heaven. Perfect. Perfect not just in holiness, but in love and goodness and truth. I try my best to be a good father to my daughter Rachel, but I don't want her growing up thinking that God is just like me. <laughs> There's something really wrong with that. He is so much bigger and better and perfect than Rachel's earthly father. And before we move on to um, I, the fact that God is father, father is a term that reminds us of the security that we have in our relationship with God. He's not an employer who might sack us, nor a friend who, who might ditch us for another, nor a, a team manager who substitutes us when we've become tired. But he is a perfect father, secure in loving us, never letting us go. And, and so in prayer, as we approach him in holiness and power, this is wonderfully assuring that nothing we say or do when we pray will stop him being our perfect, loving, heavenly father. What an awesome privilege it is to be able to come into God's presence and know that there is nothing in all creation, even the bumbling of my words, that will stop him from loving us and cherishing us as his dear children. So Jesus opens this instruction, uh, an example of prayer, his prayer advice, by saying, remind yourself of this re relationship. Remind yourself of what a privilege it is to be able to come into God's presence and to pray. Next, we read, this then is how you should pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Well friends, these verses to me seem as if they're all about bringing God glory. When we pray, our, our motivation, the purpose, the reason, the underlying goal of our prayer lives should be to glorify God. Hallowed be your name. 
That's a moment to pause everything else, to stop everything else, and to praise the name and the character and the blessings and the promises of our God. To exalt him, to join our voices with the whole of creation, to sing out his praise, all creatures of our God and King, to magnify and laud and honor him. And in prayer, to explore the depths of his character. I'm amazed that when we pray to to God, when we praise God in prayer, we never run out of things to say. I mean, if you were praising a human being, you would run out of good things to say and have to move on to some slightly more embarrassing things. But generation after generation after generation of Christian believers have found the depth and the richness in praising our God. Hallowed be thy name. But this line, hallowed be your name, this prayer, it's not just that you you or I should exalt God and praise him, but that his name would be praised by people right across our community and our town and our region and across Wales, across the UK, across the world. Even even in these bizarre times, in these difficult and uncertain days, my desire, the, the heart of a disciple, is to see God's name exalted and lifted high, to be honoured and adored by people right across this world and across our communities. It's wonderful, it's a real encouragement that so many folk, perhaps you are one of them, are joining us to worship God in these YouTube services, maybe it's for the first time. If you are searching for security and hope in these days, If you know this is the kind of time when the world should be praying to God, if you're longing for God to do something, anything, change things, if you are one of the hundreds of thousands of UK residents who are turning to God in these days, it's a delight to see you praising him and exalt him. You are a real encouragement. And I would encourage you to lift your heart in praise now. Almighty God, hallowed be thy name. O Lord, hear the sound of hearts returning to you. Be praised, almighty God. A disciple's desire is that God's kingdom would come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There's a challenge in these words that really struck me this week and it's that challenge to pray that God's kingdom would come. Just think about the totality of that for a moment. It's a moment when when communities and towns and cities and nations are filled with the presence and love and the power and might of God. A place where God's reign is complete with no challenges, no pain, no suffering, no burdens, no guilt, no tears, when all is peace. And Jesus says, pray for that to come. Pray for that moment. And so when I then look back over my prayer times and the things I've longed for, I realize I've been praying for things maybe just to get a little bit better. And Jesus says, don't just be praying for things just to get a little bit better. Don't settle your hearts on on this thing here or that thing there or this here. Pray for God's kingdom to come, for everything to be transformed and changed. Your will, Father, be done here on earth as it is in the heavenly realms where you reign supreme. Come, O Lord God, we want to see signs and miracles and and wonders and delights beyond our imagining. We want to see more of your kingdom, more of your reign and rule each and every day. To see people come to know the grace and love of the Lord Jesus Christ. To see families come to worship God in their hearts. For communities to be transformed. For injustice to be eradicated. And for lives everywhere to flourish in goodness and love.
Friends, if a virus can impact each and every community on earth in a matter of a few short months, with such pain and disruption, can we not also believe that God's kingdom in its unmistakable, delightful, joyous whole can come completely on earth as it is in heaven? Will you join me in being unsatisfied with the poverty of my desires for God? Where even my prayers reflect the shallowness of my faith, even my own sinful desires. Will you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, may your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Renew the face of the earth. Bring your glory, Lord God. Come and reign here in our world and come and reign here in my heart. Well, from this desire to see the entirety of God's kingdom come, Jesus encourages his disciples then to bring, to bring their requests before their God. And there are three elements to, to those requests. First, verse 11, give us today our daily bread. The image to have in mind here is that which was in the written notes for today, if you've been able to see those. Um, and the images of that daily provision of manna to the people in the wilderness during the time of the Exodus. Jesus is saying, pray for what you need today. That reflects God's will and purpose for you. Strength for the tasks ahead. Patience in the midst of lockdown. Peace for worries and anxieties. Comfort when you were in pain, when you were grieving for loved ones. And yes, food for the table and water to refresh the soul. The list goes on. Within the scope of what God is doing, bringing his kingdom, there is nothing too small, nothing too incidental to bring before God in prayer. There might be plenty of folk who are worse off than you. But God wants you to seek him to provide for what you need today and tonight. As we pray these things, so we come to see God's will move all the more clearly. I, like many others, have struggled with prayers that have gone unanswered. I don't think um, a disciple of Christ who prays um, is, uh, is exempt from that. And we often then think that prayers go unanswered because we've not prayed maybe often enough or hard enough. We've not used the right words. That this prayer thing maybe then is pointless. Or even that God's not listening. Jesus suggests another hard possibility, I think, in the words of the Lord's Prayer. That perhaps what we are asking for, although it seems like our daily bread, may not be part of God's will. That somehow in God's great wisdom, with his ways higher than ours, actually for God's kingdom to come, for, for him to be glorified and praised as we've said that we want to happen, our prayer remains unanswered. Prayer may not change every single situation, but I know that every prayer is an opportunity for God to change us. Prayer is not a transaction. We pray and God does stuff. And so often we fall into that trap of thinking in that way. I pray, God, you do stuff. Prayer is actually all about getting more of God in our lives and glorifying him. Opening our hearts to him, our real hearts, our longings, our desires, our wants. Longing it before our God and being expectant to the many and various and different and powerful ways in which he responds in his mercy and tender care. So come, pray, give us almighty God.
today our daily bread. Verse 12. And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So as well as asking God for our daily bread, we ask God for forgiveness, for healing and wholeness. Oh, as regularly as I need daily bread, do I need forgiveness for my sake, to know that grace beyond grace. Now you ask, isn't this forgiveness conditional? Because in the Lord's Prayer it says, um, We ask God for forgiveness, but as we forgive others. And a couple of verses after this, Jesus says something very similar. In fact, he he emphasizes it even more. Well, I'm not sure that Jesus means forgiveness is conditional on anything or, or anything we do. In fact, so much of the Bible is about the salvation that we know that is free, that is wonderful in Jesus Christ. It's a gift of grace to you. And that, I think, is what Jesus is getting at here. I've been forgiven at such huge cost. Christ died in my place on that cross. I've been forgiven completely and utterly. Every stain of sin is gone from my heart, even such that I can be free from guilt and shame. To know the joy of that forgiveness, the immense cost of that forgiveness, to delight in it and then deny it from someone else makes no sense at all. So Christ is encouraging us as we pray, as we receive that forgiveness that as we so, so desperately need, so we should be challenged to be people of grace and to forgive others, to reflect Christ in us as we seek God, so his glory is all the more readily seen in us. What Jesus is showing us here is that as we pray, so we should be transformed to be people of grace, to be ever more closely following his will and being his disciples. And verse 13, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Lead us from temptation. As much as we rely on God to forgive our sinful past, so we rely on his Holy Spirit to lead us away from a sinful future. Again, a wonderful encouragement and challenge because if your heart's desire is to be holy, to bring glory to God, he will and he can lead you from the temptations to glorify yourself or something else. The challenge, of course, is to mean it when we say these words, to lead us from temptation. Lord God, I don't want to go there because I want to glorify you and praise you in the way that I live my life. And as we pray, allow God to change us and renew us and to meet us in our desire to glorify him. And deliver us from evil. The Lord's Prayer is a prayer of deliverance. That trusting Christ, we might be free from the devil and his lies. That we might be refocused and renewed as a beloved child of God. Holy and wonderfully, the Lord Jesus Christ's. Jesus encourages us to pray as his disciples and remind ourselves of the wonderful intimate relationship that we have with our heavenly father. He encourages us to pray and seek the glory of God and his kingdom coming in its fullness and entirety. 
and he encourages us to pray that we might bring our deepest needs, the longings of our hearts, before his throne of grace, that we might receive our daily bread, be forgiven, resist temptation, and be delivered from the evil one. Well, friends, I think it's probably time that we stop talking about these words and actually use them in our prayers. Let's pray. And so we come to share communion together. Now is a good time to make sure that you have your version of bread and wine to hand. If you, uh, if you need to hit the pause button now to go and get what you need, then do so. Uh, press pause and then just come back and press play when you're ready. So we come to share in bread and wine to remember what Christ has done for us his body broken, his blood poured out for you, for us, because of his great love. All those who love the Lord Jesus Christ are invited to share in this moment of remembrance and by God's spirit, renewal by eating and drinking together. And so it is following Christ's example that we pray and we give thanks to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come to bring you thanks and praise, recognizing that you are the creator and sustainer of all that there is. You are our holy, omnipotent, powerful, majestic, wonderful God, reigning supreme over the whole of your creation, over heaven and earth. And yet as we come to you and pray now, so we do as Christ advised, uh, as he shared, as he explained to us, we call you our heavenly Father. Oh Father, it is a joy and delight to call you Father. To recognize the personal an intimate relationship that you have wanted with, with your creation, with your people 
throughout all the generations. We thank you for the way in which you reached out to folk throughout throughout the the history of creation, calling people to your side, sending prophets, speaking your word through the law. And Lord God, we rejoice that at just the right time you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, into the world. That living amongst us, he would know what it meant to need daily bread. We thank you for the way he taught us, showed us how to pray. We thank you for the forgiveness that he won for us on the cross. We thank you that there he took our sin and our shame. He died because of our sin and been raised to new life. Showed us that he has defeated sin and all of its consequences, including death itself, opening up the way to eternal life and calling us still to follow him. So Lord God, as we repent and as we turn from our sin now, so we pray that you would assure us by your Holy Spirit of that forgiveness. Remind us of that challenge to be your, your grace-filled people. That as we recognize the, the forgiveness that Christ has won for us, so we are to be people of grace. Change us and renew us, prompting us now by your Holy Spirit. Those relationships where we need to do something to bring healing. Move by your Holy Spirit in us, we pray. Encourage us in our discipleship. Make us more like Christ. Move by your Holy Spirit and transform this bread and wine and the bread and wine in our homes that we have before us into symbols of the body of Christ and the blood of Christ, broken and poured out for us. And come, Holy Spirit, fill us, renew us, restore us, strengthen us for the days ahead that we might journey through these days with peace, with patience, with your love and a sense of your presence with us. And Lord God, we rejoice that because of Christ's death on the cross for us, a place in heaven is assured for us when that day comes, when your kingdom comes in its totality, in its entirety. And Lord God, we pray for that day now. We pray that your kingdom would come, that the whole of this earth would be renewed and transformed, that the name of the Lord Jesus Christ would be lifted on high. And we look forward to that day when we gather with all of the saints around your throne in praise and worship of you, almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who is to be ever praised. Thanks be to God. Amen. And so I'd invite you to take your bread and wine and to eat and drink as I do. Copy me as we go through this next part of the service. And so we remember on the night when Jesus was betrayed, after giving thanks, Jesus took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you.
in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the blood of the new covenant. Drink of it, all of you, in remembrance of me. Oh, almighty God, we thank you for meeting us by your Holy Spirit as we have shared together in fellowship, shared together remembering the Lord Jesus Christ, shared together in being renewed in our faith and strengthened for the journey ahead. And so let us go to, to serve and glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen. So friends, we're going to sing together our final hymn for this evening. A wonderful hymn that talks about the assurance that as we come to God before the throne of God above, I have a strong, a perfect plea pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, our Saviour and King.
Christ on high, with Christ my Saviour and my God, with Christ my Saviour Well, friends, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, I hope God has spoken with, to you, met with you, and really blessed you in the time that we've been able to share together tonight. Um, my prayer now is that we would go with the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. May he be with you this night and always. Amen. <laughs>